are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. Hi, everyone. Wow. Excited to do this amazing style justice. Uh, and thank you for listening and watching in whatever form you are uh, joining A Sense of Beer Style and me and Jeremy. And today, Jeremy, we talk about Municellus, which is a part of the pale malt European lager category. And again, a sense of beer style, we are following the 2021 beer judge certification guidelines. Um, and this Municellus style, where I'm jealous, I'm not doing a great job. Jeremy's got three to try. I have none. Um, bad on me. Oops, here's, but he'll show you. Here's one. He'll show you a few. Yeah, good. Here's two. And, so and then one of the one of the classics. Absolutely. One of the absolute classics. And what we're going to do in kicking this off is really, I just want to quickly talk about the relevance of the style. Now, Munich Hellas is a beer style that prior to um, the era of, you know, American uh, IPA and, and all these things we're drinking in the States per se, you had um, these European lagers, right? And once European lagers became um, paler, uh, they originally were um, mostly darker, um, particularly because of the challenge with the malts and the water. Um, we had um, something to model after, after the Czech uh, Bohemian Pilsner that has now evolved by name. Um, but the, um, the folks in Munich didn't want to be left out, right? They wanted their own version. And frankly, you had Southern Germany and Northern Germany both creating their own styles. So the German pills today, which we're not talking about as much, um, that's not the Munich House. That's more of a Northern Germany um, invention in the late 1800s. Then it's been emulated. And that inspired our Munich Hellas, which is more so um, from the South. With that, um, let's talk about, Jeremy, typical ingredients just to set the sensory stage for the Munich Hellas. Well, this is why yeah, we're not. So, I mean, we're beer professionals, Julia. We're not supposed to say we have favorites. In fact, a lot of beer professionals avoid that question at all costs. But I have to say, Munich Hellas is one of my favorite children. Um, and and I think uh, I listened to Garrett Oliver describe uh, Munich Hellas, and, and as far as the ingredients are concerned, once, and I thought it was dead on. You have this beer that is refreshing. It is complex. It is simple. But you you basically just have the four basic ingredients. There's nothing really too uh, complex about the ingredient list. It it's, uh, takes me back to the uh, music, you know, like the blues. They call it four chords and the truth. To me, the Munich Hellas is four chords and the truth. You have your 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 uh, you know your German Pilsner, your uh, your Germanic uh, noble hops, the Hollertal middle fruit, those type of things. You have your um, uh, your uh, uh, your lager yeast, and then you have that just beautiful uh, semi-hard water that comes from Munich, um, which is why the darker beers proliferated because it just didn't do well with the hops, and and it just made the malty beers come through. But they figured out a way to to bring these lighter beers when they all came into vogue and light beers dominated the world. The Munich Hellas came through and and just provided that. Um, but it, it's a very simple. Uh, recipe. I've brewed one myself, and it didn't come out anywhere near as good as the ones you get in Munich. But it, it wasn't half bad. Let me just say, I I did a lot of thorough research on on those ten gallons I made, and and uh, and yeah, I'm gonna have to brew it again. Let's just let's put it that way. Um, but the ingredients are simple. Um, as far as uh, putting all these ingredients together, but we kind of alluded to it still can be kind of complex. Tell us about the overall experience, the overall flavor summary that you get from this? Jeremy, sensory summary, and you touched upon some of it, uh, really is centric to the drinkability, right? Um, the pale lagers uh, of Europe that are certainly brewed across the world now are, are meant to be very sessionable. 
um, predominantly uh, Pilsner malt and um, you know, graham cracker, uh, soda cracker, saltine type of malt note flavors. Lager yeast is not going to have us have really big um, ester notes because that's not what lager, bring, lager yeast brings to the table. Accessionability also is usually accompanied by um, a fair amount of carbonation, 2.7 volumes of CO2 would be expected. So sessionable, absolutely approachable, um, not high in alcohol, and we'll talk about all that. Um, and first, with that stage set, let's get uh, into some of the appearance. Well, the appearance, and I, I saved I saved this moment, but um, and this is gonna we're gonna talk about this glass a little bit later on. But as we pour this, hopefully you can hear this sound. These these beers are a very medium, uh, are moderately pale to slightly gold color. You've got this, uh, and they should be very clear, if not brilliantly so. This off-white creamy head that really, really wants to get going. If you pour it right, uh, especially you know down the middle, you're going to get this really nice rocky head at the very end of it all. Um, but but this head should persist. It should stick around for a while. It, it, it should invite you to smell the beer every time you take a sip because of that head and all these volatiles that are just just shooting out of the glass. Um, that is what is expected out of a Munich Hellas. And you'll see uh, later on when we talk about vital stats and the specs, the specs are pretty tight. The ingredient list is very clear. So a Munich Hellas has uh, less room for interpretation um, from that standpoint. But um, but that's just the appearance. Um, I think you're going to talk to us about the aroma that I kind of, uh, kind of teed you up on, right? Yeah. So in talking about the aroma, Jeremy, this is one where I will take issue with the Beard Judge Certification Program style guidelines. Um, let's face it, the basic taste, and we know that flavor is a triangle, basic taste, aromatic compounds, and mouthfeel. Basic taste being sweet, salt, sour, bitter, umami, emerging as oleogustus or fat. All of that said, those basic tastes cannot be smelled. Um, they cannot um, emit an aroma. So when the BJCP guidelines overview the Munich Hellas, you're going to read moderate, grainy, sweet, malt aroma, and it's going to say the freshest examples will have more of a malty, sweet aroma. That's an issue to me because you can't smell sweet. That said, that malty soda water um, or soda um, cracker, um, saltine type of malt flavor is the predominant aspect when you go ahead and get an essence of the aroma of this beer. You're also going to get a sense of the German noble hops that are in here, mm -hmm. low to moderately low, spicy floral, um, almost maybe to minty or herbal German hops. Um, and that's about it. It's a very um, sensible, approachable beer. And, and frankly, that's why it's, it's so uh, popular. And what it, um, it, what from there is is going on to the taste? Well, and that's where it's it just the aroma, the flavor. It it's simple yet complex. It's 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 what you needed to be when you needed to be that thing for me. Um, this is uh, you know to to your point, we can't technically smell sweet, but the aromas always take me to that place, that experience where I'm I'm thinking sweet, and that's because I always get <clears throat> with different. Um, Different beers from Municella of the Municella style. Sometimes I get sweet corn check cereal. Sometimes I get this sweet biscuit, maybe a very light pale honey. Um, but the but the balance on this, the flavor balance on this, should be slanted a little bit more toward the malt. And I'm a malt head, so that's perfect for me. But you should get this medium, malty, grainy, sweet, complex yet simple at the same time, which is kind of hard to define. But uh, this uh, grain um, uh, flavor, the hops, the hop bitterness should be medium low to, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, yeah, medium low to low. It's not a very bitter beer. We are slanted towards the sweet malty side of things. Um, and along with that, uh, frankly, for me, when you have the bitterness that's like that, it really is just to keep the sweetness in check from running away into cloying town. Um, we don't want a beer that's just so sweet it's annoying. So um, the the hops are really there to just kind of show a little bit of balance there. Uh, but the flavor that comes from the hops, that's where it's still uh, low to medium low, but you start getting some of that um, that herbal twig 
uh, maybe just a slight black pepper depending on which hops they use um, and very very rare occasions sometimes i'll get just a slight berry when the hops are fresh or when the beers are fresh um, but it is just a beautiful beer um, and I'm just double checking my notes too, but, uh, the, the, the finish of this, one of the things I love about this, it's not snappy and refreshing like a German pills would be. It's soft, um, and smooth on the finish. Um, it shouldn't be, uh, spicy. It shouldn't be snappy. It shouldn't be overly dry. Um, it, it's just a, it's just a wonderful, soft palate experience when it's done right. And that for me, that's kind of what the flavor entails. Um, but I, I, again, I kind of jumped into your world a little bit. You're talking about mouthfeel. So municalis in the mouthfeel is very straightforward. It's a quick answer. Medium body, medium carbonation, um, you know, smooth, uh, well lagered character, laid down lager is that that's what lager means is laid down. Um, the freshest examples uh, will uh, um, certainly have a lot more to the flavor than when they age, but the mouthfeel will not be affected. And there's not a lot of astringency in the mouthfeel, uh, no matter how fresh or not. Um, and it's it's a very, very approachable beer in, in that aspect. No acidity except for coming from the, you know, the, the water itself um, to whatever pH levels have been used. Um, and I would think that this is a really good one when you're doing your beer studies to pay attention to the style comparisons. So, Jeremy, what styles would we compare this to and why is it different than the ones you're going to bring up to us? Well, the, the classic ones um, to compare this to would be a Munich Dunkel. But, of course, a Munich Dunkel will be darker, have more dark grain flavors, more Maillard reaction, whereas this is pale and kind of light bready. But those two are kind of siblings of each other from the grand uh, scheme of things. Another style that this is commonly uh, compared to would be the uh, Czech Premium Pale, or commonly referred to as a Bohemian Pilsner or a Bo Pils, uh, just because they're both have a prominent malt flavor coming out of them. But what you'll find is with the uh, with the Czech Pilsner, you'll have a little bit more of a Saz hop flavor. You'll have a little bit more of a diacetyl um, a flavor coming from that unique style. Uh, but uh, the the um, hop bitterness is going to be more prominent and more in balance in the uh, Czech premium pale than this will. This is a strong lean toward malt. And for those of you who are malt heads, the, this beer is for you. Um, but they, these are the styles that are commonly um, uh, referenced when they're comparing to the Municellus. But we need to talk about some of the commercial examples that you would expect uh, from this beer. Yeah, and a lot of them are still very easy to obtain today. You do want to keep an eye out for freshness because with any of the specialty imports, freshness is not always guaranteed. Um, Jeremy's got one in front of him that he can hold up while I'm chatting, the Vine Steffner Original, um, which is frankly one of the oldest breweries in the world. Um, Hofbrau Original, you can still go to the Hofbrau House in Germany. I've been to that beer hall in Munich, believe it or not. Uh, and then Spaten Premium Lager really helped establish the style. So anything from Spaten is good. Hacker Shore is mentioned a lot. Um, and then you have American examples. Um, you know, my neck of the woods of Colorado, Dry Drop Brewing is known for their Hellas. Victory Brewing out of Pennsylvania has a Hellas Lager. Um, Austin Beer Garden, I don't know if they still make it, but hell yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are some great U.S. craft examples of this style that pay heed to all the traditions and simplicity of this amazing beer. And so we're almost in the home stretch. Um, I would say, Jeremy, kind of give us a way to think about the numbers and the beer stats behind Munich Hellas. Well, before I do, just a little shout out to all the craft brewers who are trying to brew the style. And it's, it's hard. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Not only does it provide just a, a heck of a great name scheme, um, uh, but you have a lot of craft brewers that are trying to tackle the style. Um, so you don't have to rely on on uh, versions from Germany that are maybe oxidized. Maybe you've seen better days. You can get fresh versions of this, and a lot of them are brewed well. I mean, it's not a difficult uh, uh, recipe to develop. But uh, but that being said, when we talk about the uh, when we talk about the vital stats, the ABV, uh, you'll notice when you study this uh, style that they're they kind of have pretty tight specs uh, and they're a little bit, uh, uh, a little strange. It's not an easy, like four to 6% um, type of thing that some beers will be. 
the Munich Hellas is four seven to five four uh, in, in the ABV range. That's a really tight, uh, like five point uh, five point spread. Um, and when we get to the IBUs, remember we talked. It is a uh, there's enough uh, bitterness there just to keep it the uh, the balance there. But it's a very malt driven beer. Again, it's a very narrow spread from sixteen to twenty two. So uh, the IBUs. Uh, this is not a bitter beer. Um, and, and even the specs between that, uh, are just very tight. Uh, same thing with SRM. It's a very pale to kind of a light gold color. Um, every brewery may have their own variation of it and that's fine and dandy, but when you, uh, stick it into a competition and you're trying to compare how it is that just understand that these are very, um, very specific, uh, these vital stats. Uh, when we get to the original gravity, then we're talking about 1044 to 1048 uh, for the specific gravity. Again, very tight specs, um, and and it kind of uh, speaks to having a lower uh, alcohol to begin with. But the final gravity, uh, we go from 1006 to 1012. Now we're talking from a quite light body to maybe a medium light body when we get to 1012. Um, I use 1010. As as below that is going to be fairly dry. Above that, it's going to start getting uh, have a little bit more body to it, and so that kind of skirts that fence or uh, dances on that fence. Um, those are the vital stats of this beer. It's it's uh, it's a very specific beer. Um, it's meant to be brewed in a very specific way, but it is it's worth the attempt if you uh, try to brew it yourself, especially uh, any home brewers. But um, yeah, so let's talk about uh, glassware. So, Jeremy, if you can hold up the glass that you showed us, you know, a handled mug, picture being in a German beer garden, drinking lots of these because they're sessionable mm -hmm. and the and the waitress or, or waiter brings it over with multiple um, glasses in the hand, that handled dimpled mug um, in your right hand, I believe, that's really traditionally what we're used to seeing this in a one liter size, which would be 33 U.S. ounces. And then your traditional fluted glass that we see some Pilsner served in or Jeremy's holding and put up to the camera, the Willie Becker, yes. which is, um, that's a, that's a, that's a U.S. craft brewer version maybe of the Willie Becker. Yep. Um, but that is, those are the types of styles of, uh, of, uh, glassware that allow the CO2 to volatilize out. So you fill up less, you still get a sense of the aromatics, um, but it's more mug style beer, um, because those are meant to be drinking two or three in a sitting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then pairing suggestions, go for it and bring us home here. Oh, gosh, pairing. Um, so I think about the dominant flavors that are coming out of this and the aromas. You have this this beautiful, light, golden, honey, kind of sweetened, bready, uh, dominant flavor with a little bit of uh, back flavor of just like garden herbs and twigs and pepper. Um, to me, I, I, this is a total cop out. I'm sorry, Julia, but this could go with nearly anything. Um but frankly, there's enough body there. There's enough flavor there that it can stand toe to toe with some pretty, uh, pretty impactful foods. I, I the, right off the bat, I want to have something fried with this. I want to have something grilled with this. Um, uh, it, it's more seasonal, but come summertime, I'll I'll have a summer salad with nice grilled chicken, and this will be awesome with it because it provides that kind of bread component where the croutons would go as far as the salad goes. But gosh, you're not going to go wrong with this beer. Um, pair it with anything. I dare you. What What would you pair? Yeah. And it's okay if it gets barreled over. It's still going to refresh um, mm -hmm. and lighten up the palate and quench your thirst, right? Um, so if the food dish is too strong because this is a lower ABV beer of the sessionable level in the five some odd percent range, you'll be okay. You just won't taste it as well. And the attributes of almost like fresh baked bread is in this beer. So I do go to bread. I go to... Um, you know, the classic German pretzel and, and a mug of this, like yeah. that is just such a satisfying thing with little salinity from the salt crystals that are mm -hmm. on that pretzel that are going to brighten up and sharpen up the actual noble hop flavors and bring those forth more forward because they're normally lower in this beer, the hop flavor, um, you know, something as simple as that and potato chips, like salty, bready. That's what I want with this just as a snack. Um, and then the full entree, you can go, you know, to the moon and back and whatever pleases you um, and uh, whatever floats your boat. Uh, but this beer really does showcase well when um, complemented with things that give it that um, 
uh, that soda cracker saltine type of uh, note in whatever is being served next to it. Well, and, and you triggered a, a, a thought and more of a flavor memory too. This this beer in particular does very well complementing like savory spicy sausage, especially that with like a deli mustard, um, like a brown spicy mustard. This is just heaven with that combination. And I think that's a reason why that they serve these things together quite often. Um, so it, it's, it's a, that's a slam dunk as far as I'm concerned, but Munich yep. tell us it, it, it fights above its weight class. It's a, it's a great all around beer. It, uh, to me, it's the multi-tool of beer. You can use it for just about anything and you're going to be happy with it. Well said. Um, can't can't do any better than that for a strong finish there. Thanks for joining us for the Munich Pellis. Um, and what a great beer. Go out and get some and, and drink several today. Thank you for listening to Essence of Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia. And me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.